Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zero Education. So we continue talking about uh, relativity, special theory of relativity, and right now we are only approaching um, this particular topic. So we are still at the end of um, 19th century, um, and uh, the previous lecture was about reference frames, basically. So how do we measure where exactly the object is and um, how it moves within this system of coordinates. So we have chosen uh, Cartesian space coordinates and we have introduced um, inertial reference frames which mean that uh, any more uh, any particular object which uh, has no outside influence from the forces or all forces are cancelling each other um, so this uh, particular object is moving in uh, inertial uh, reference frame along a straight line with uniform speed so that was kind of a definition of uh, inertial frames and um, what uh, other very very important point was in the previous lecture that all inertial frames basically are the same in the properties which you can observe all the physics laws are exactly the same and uh, as an example if you are in a moving very smoothly moving um, train car um, along a straight line with constant speed you will not be able to detect that you are moving relative to let's say other objects outside of this train so all the laws of physics are the same it's called principle of relativity <coughs> and what's important this principle of relativity is basically taken into the next step into theory of relativity as is. So the principle of relativity <coughs> is basically accepted as, as a true principle and uh, in this particular case all the inertial systems are exactly the same. Okay, now we will talk about two different inertial systems which are moving uh, against each other and the movement is supposed to be along a straight line with the uh, with constant speed and uh, we will choose a point um, we will choose the way how they're moving these systems <coughs> so that their axes are always parallel to each other so we will assume that at time sometime zero both systems are coinciding so one system will be called capital X Y and Z but I will drop Y and Z and the time will be measured uh, as T and another system which I will put here I will use lowercase letters so this is the another inertial system which is moving uh, along the x-axis so x and x are coinciding at point time zero these points coincide so the systems are at the same position basically at time zero <coughs> and and then we assume that this system we will call this one alpha and this one beta we are assuming that the beta system is moving along the x-axis with constant speed v so now our point is that we somehow knowing where exactly the point is in one system this is point P let's say 
we know its coordinates and we would like to find out its coordinates after certain time t uh, in another uh, reference frame in reference frame beta. So knowing alpha coordinates we would like to find beta coordinates. Now why this is important we will actually see later. So for now let's just assume that this is our task. Let's concentrate on this task. But it does have a purpose, I promise. So how can we determine the coordinates? Now the other two uh, axes, y and z, they are basically different. They're three-dimensional space plus the time. But I wanted the time to be represented. That's why I dropped other two dimensions, y and z. And I'm assuming that since all the axes are parallel to each other and there is no movement along y or z, movement is only along the x-axis. So these two systems are completely coinciding in the beginning and then moves along the s, uh, along the x. So y and z remains ex exactly the same. So I can basically tell um, that um, one more very important thing is we are assuming that the time is um, absolute, it's universal. There is no difference in time uh, progressing uh, in two systems. Now, that is something which um, will be changed as we will go into the relativity part. But before the relativity was actually introduced, time was considered absolute which means if we are standing, let's say, uh, on the station and we are moving in the train, which is moving very smoothly, it's inertial, two inertial frames, now the time will be exactly the same in both cases. So if the watch of one person is the same here and here when it was the beginning of time, the watch you go is, is going with exactly the same speed here and here, so the time is exactly the same. So always, at all the uh, at all the time, t is equal to t, capital T and lowercase t. This is time in alpha. This is time in beta. They are the same. What about y and z? I have already told they're not uh, they are not changing. They are the same because it's moving only along the x axis, so the only x coordinate is changing. How? Well, it's actually very simple. Let's assume that the p, point p, is stationar stationary in reference frame alpha. Now, it has certain coordinates. Again, y and z not really important. What's important is this coordinate xp. Well, which means that this distance is equal to xp, right? Now, if this, if this system beta is moving with constant speed v, it means that after a certain time t, this distance will be equal to v times t, right? This is speed, this is time, so this distance, um, the origin of coordinates of the beta system moved by this particular distance from. So, what is the coordinates of the p in this system now? Well, since we move to the right, coordinate of p uh, would be x p of t would be equal to original x p minus v times t, right? <coughs> so we are interested in this distance. Well, it's negative, right? So we are subtracting not from this, subtracting this but from this subtracting that. If point P is a little bit further, it would be a little bit m better understood if you wish. Um, let's say P is somewhere here. Now this distance 
is xp and this distance is v times t so this distance which is coordinate x coordinate of point p in this system would be again xp minus v times t so this is the transformation of coordinates it used to be xp which is stationary it doesn't change with the time but this one is changing with the time okay now what other coordinates are changing well i just put it this way these are not changing and time is the same so this is transformation of coordinates from one inertial system from alpha to beta okay now we just assumed that the point p is stationary in alpha what if it's not what if it's moving with the time does it change anything well if position p is actually a function of time basically all we have to do is put here sorry, capital T. It doesn't really matter that it's moving. It's still exactly the same thing. Original position and the x is changing by vt. So if p have moved to somewhere else, at point capital T, which is exactly the same as lower kt, because we assume that the time is exactly the same, it doesn't matter that it moved. Wherever it moved, since origin is moving by vt, v times t, then we have exactly the same situation. So, now, one more little thing. Do we really depend on a concrete point p? Well, it can be any point. We didn't really have anything specific about this point. So in general, I can say that x of, of time t is equal to capital X of time t minus v times t. And these guys remain the same. And t is equal to t. So this is transformation of coordinates. Now, what are the coordinates? Well, coordinates in the alpha are t, x, y, and z. Coordinates in beta are lowercase t, lowercase x, y, and z. So from these four, we have transformed into these four. This is called a Galilean transformation. So this is the transformation of coordinates which was kind of obvious, very much understood by everybody. It seems to be very natural. It corresponds to our intuition, if you wish. There is absolutely no contradiction in this. So this is called a Galilean transformation. Now, what about this Galilean transformation? Now, what's interesting is, is it's, it's actually reversible. Because again, think about this. Inertial frames are exactly the same in sense of physical laws. So if inertial frame beta is moving with a speed v relative to inertial frame alpha, it means that inertial frame alpha is moving with a speed minus v relative to frame beta, right? And there is absolutely no difference, which means that all these laws are completely reversible instead of v i will use minus v and what will i have in this case i will have that capital x of t is equal to lower case of t plus v times lower case t and capital y is equal to lowercase y, capital Z is equal to, it's 
equal to lowercase z, and capital T is equal to lowercase t. Exactly the same, except minus and plus, because beta moves with the speed y, uh, uh, v relative to alpha, but alpha uh, moves with the speed minus v relative to beta. So these two transformations are completely reversible. They are inverse to each other. Now, this kind of uh, uh, inversity, if you wish, um, can be very easily expressed in vector and matrix form. So let me just do this for completeness. So let's first have the transformation from alpha to beta. So we need a vector t, x, y, and z to be product of certain matrix of transformation times, as matrix times vector, uh, the alpha coordinates. Now, these are all functions of time, of course. So what's the matrix here? Well, this matrix is very simple. 0, 0, 0, 0, um, minus v, 0, minus v, 1. Okay, let's see if it works. T is supposed to be product of this row by this column, right? 1 times T is T, 0 times X, Y, and Z would be 0. So T is equal to T. Next, X of T. Minus V times T plus 1 times X of T. So that's exactly what we need x of t minus vt, and 0 the rest. y times this, so this times this, lowercase y would be 0 times t, 0 times x, and only y will be here, and z will be 0. And same thing with 0. So this is exactly correct product of matrix of transformation by the vector of coordinates in one um, uh, reference frame, and that gives me coordinates in another re reference frame. Now, considering V uh, would be an opposite movement, so in, in theory my reverse transformation matrix should look very similar, so that should be T, X, Y, and Z of T vector it should be equal to, okay, what's the matrix? Matrix should be exactly the same, except I should have plus V instead of minus V, right? Let's check, let's check it out. Times T, X of T, Y of T, and Z of T. Okay, now, 1 times lowercase t and 0 the rest. So product of this row by this column, that gives me my, my first element. Now product of this times this, v times t, 1 times x and 0 gives me x and the same thing, uh, the rest of this. So these two matrices are supposed to be inverse to each other. Well, which means what? which means if we will multiply them as matrix by matrix, we should have a unit matrix with only ones on the main diagonal. As an exercise, please do it, and you will see that exactly this times this will give you the unit matrix, all zero except the main diagonal, which, which we will have once. And we will be canceling each other. Okay? And also, what's very interesting, the determinant of this matrix is 1, which actually means the matrix is orthogonal. It preserves the matrix. Okay, these are all mathematical kind of 
um, uh, considerations um, because you know it's it's actually matrix of transformation. That's what basically it is. From one system of coordinate to another, it's a linear operator, if you wish. But in any case, physicists don't really like to do this type of things. They don't really think much about these inverse matrices, etc. But doesn't really matter. The Galilean transformation can be expressed as this matrix, as two inverse matrix from alpha to beta or from beta to alpha, and it's really very, very simple. Only the x coordinate is changing because we are moving only within the x direction, and it's changing very, very simply. The coordinate is equal, x is equal to capital uh, lowercase x, in this case plus v times times, or if it's lowercase from uppercase it's the minus v. Okay, so that's basically it. I wanted to introduce just a concept of what is Galilean transformation. This concept was completely dominant until Einstein actually started working on this. Uh, not that people did not understand how different coordinate system can be differently transformed into each other. Um, uh, definitely there was a very, very important transformation, which is not this one. It's, it's called Lorentz transformation. Um, the uh, famous physicist Lorentz uh, actually invented it for one purpose only. But that would be the subject of the next lecture. Not about Lorentz, but about Galilean transformation, which actually was not exactly what people expected it to be in certain cases, and that's when Lorentz transformation came to replace it. And that would be already used in theory of relativities. So, this is it. That's for introduction into Galilean, Galilean transformation. Uh, please read the notes for this uh, lecture, so you have to go to unizor.com, uh, the course called Relativity, and uh, it's within the first uh, um, part of this course, where I'm just talking about principles of uh, relativities, and it's called Galilean Transformation Lecture. Thank you very much, and good luck.